So what are the reasons we have monopolies in the first place? Well, there's a number of possible reasons. One could, is it could be government protected. For example, in the case of a patent, if you invent a really cool medical machine, for example, the government might want to reward you for that creative um, contribution to the economy by giving you a temporary monopoly over selling the product you've invented, and that's a patent. And of course, there's a patent duration like 17 years where you get a monopoly over selling that particular product for 17 years. Um, <clears throat> it could be that the company has a monopoly because they have control over an input. Um, <clears throat> the company may have a, mono a monopoly because there's high startup costs, so it's really difficult to um, start up. So it's difficult for other firms to enter the industry. Um, you could have um, a natural monopoly, which I'll explain in a second. And you could have demand-side economies of scale. Or those are also referred to as network effects, which is very similar to control over an input, except it's control over a network. And for example, Facebook, social media, um, uh, Amazon, many, many different companies that are popular in today's world are popular because people want access to other people on that particular platform. And this gets into platform economics, but it's a newer um, version of monopoly. It's one of the reasons why we have so many tech giants that have monopoly powers. They have control over the network of people that are tapped into their product. Um, and that gives them a lot of power. All right, so what about natural monopoly? How does this look? How do we interpret this on a graph? How do we think about it? Let's look at a graph. All right, to think about why we might have natural monopolies, um, we think about the average total cost curve. And when you look at this graph, um, which is figure 25.6, 25.6 in the textbook, um, we've got quantity on the x-axis, but we can think of this as firm size or um, the scale of the firm. Like how big is each company that's producing these products? And we know that larger companies have advantages. They can sort of spread their costs of administration. They can spread their costs of janitorial staff. There's a lot of costs that they can spread across the products um, when they're a larger firm. We just know that bigger firms can produce things more cheaply for, for a variety of reasons. So for that reason, um, firms often have um, this factor where the bigger the firm is, the lower the average total cost. And eventually costs are going to go up if you've hired all of a particular type of input. Maybe you need scientists or maybe you need um, some type of specialized worker. Eventually you're going to hire out all of those and you're going to have to raise the, the wage really high to hire more of those. So eventually total costs are going to go up. But <clears throat> oftentimes the larger the company, the cheaper you can produce. And this is of course called economies of scale. And then after you've reached the maximum efficiency of scale, um, costs are going to go up, and after that you have diseconomies of scale. So we have diseconomies of scale where the larger the firm gets, the less efficient the firm is. But for a lot of firms, you get pretty large before you experience any kind of diseconomies of scale. So we do see economies of scale in a lot of industries. And this graph is just representing that based on firm size. How do we think about the average cost of production according to firm size? Now, you might imagine if you're thinking about the demand for a particular product in an industry, um, if the demand curve is coming through here and looks something like this, um, <clears throat> then this industry is actually most efficient if one firm produces all of their goods, because that one firm can produce them most efficiently. Um, so if another firm tried to enter, let's imagine that there's this one firm that's meeting all the demand at the industry, um, and this firm is really big, and a competitor came in and tried to compete. That competitor just can't produce as cheaply as the really big firm. So even though we know this big firm is probably a monopoly and is probably jacking up prices really high because of that, 
if an entrant, a small company, a firm that was um, really small in scale, tried to enter, um, the large company could easily, easily undercut them. Um, so that threat that the large company can undercut any firm that tries to enter the industry, that threat is always present and will make this a natural monopoly. It'll give this really large firm this power that makes it hard for competitors to enter the industry. Now we might imagine if the demand curve is like way out here, like let's say it's twice that, um, then this industry can easily have two different firms. This is the second demand. You'd have one firm that's this big and another firm that's about the same size. They both produce really efficiently. This industry with this kind of demand will naturally have com two competing firms. But if the demand for the product is really um, about equal to the optimal size of the company, then there's a case that this might be a situation where you have a natural monopoly. And natural monopolies can still be bad because they might keep the price really high unless somebody tries to enter, in which case they'd lower the price to keep that person out, and then they'd raise the price again. So you're kind of stupid to try to come in and compete with a natural monopoly that already has huge economies of scale. Um, so that's a natural monopoly.